Ahoy there folks, I'm Captain Benzie and welcome back to another video for EVE Online. In today's video, I'm going to walk you through the process I go through every time I want to fit a ship for exploration. I'm going to be doing this using the Minmatar Republic's Tech 2 Covert Ops Frigate, the Cheetah, because this is my personal favourite explorer. But the methodology that we're going to be covering will cover you no matter which ship you want to fly and what level your skills are at. So if you've grabbed a Tech 1 Explorer or a Tech 2 Covert Ops Frigate, heck, even something like a Metamorphosis, a Pacifier or an Astero, this should teach you how you are going to fit that to best suit your personal individual needs. If you do enjoy this video, if you find it helpful, please let me know. Take a brief moment just to hit like on it and drop a comment down below. And if you do want to help support this channel financially, well, you can hit me up on PayPal, my Patreon. You can pledge to support there and get your name in the stars at the end of the video. And I do also have a Redbubble merchandise store if you're interested in that kind of thing. In fact, one of the product lines that I run on Redbubble is my Lucid Echo line. That is based on this exact ship spinning in the hangar in front of you all now. This is the Lucid Echo, my absolute favorite and most flown ship probably in EVE Online. Maybe secondary to the Hurricane, but hey, we're going off topic. Finally, if you are new to EVE Online and you haven't used a referral link already, heck, even if you're coming back after 10, 15 years hiatus, there is a referral link in the description down below. You can click on that, log in, earn yourself 1 million free skill points. I get a small kickback too. And while you're down there, there's also the Catskull Community Discord. Great place to come and chat with a load of like-minded EVE Online players who will help you in any way we can in regards to learning this game. Even if you want to come and join the Catskull Cartel in-game as well, that's how you find us and make an application. Anyway, with all of that lengthy preamble out of the way, let's jump right into the methodology I use when fitting an exploration vessel. Before we can talk about actually fitting a ship for exploration, we need to figure out which ship you want to actually fly. And there are going to be a number of different factors that influence your decision. I'm also a firm believer that there is no right or wrong choice. I know some people in my comment section would have you believe that there are ships that are categorically better than everything else and that you should just play zoomed out if you think a ship's ugly. But you still know which ship you're flying, right? If you're in an Imacus, you know what it looks like, even if you can't see it. But there we go. Ultimately, everyone's going to have their own personal criteria. Probably the least important of these is your skills. That is to say, if you started off as a Minmatar pilot, you're going to have at least some skills already in Minmatar Frigate, therefore making the Probe or even the Cheetah just that little bit closer in reach. But if you started off, say, as an Amar player and decided that actually the Cheetah does look really cool to you and that's the one you want to fly, it's not like Minmatar Frigate is a particularly in intensive skill train, right? It's not nice and easy to dip into and out of all of these. Same if you've gone Minmatar and you quite fancy, say, something like the Heron or the Buzzard. This means that skills are certainly a factor, but they're probably not going to be the defining factor. You might be like me, and just the visuals of the ship in specific are what entice you to a particular hull. For instance, I really like the Cheetah. I love the way that ship looks, therefore it's the one I'm going to fly, but I do also quite like the look of the Buzzard. I do fly that from time to time. I'm not a big fan at all of the Helios, so even though some people would tell you this is categorically one of the best explorers, it's never going to be one I undock much because I just don't like how it looks. And yes, I know I can zoom the camera out, I'm not an idiot, but I'm also not an idiot, which means even with the camera zoomed out, I still know what ship I'm flying, right? So yeah, that visuals are going to come into it. There's also the slot arrangement of the different ships. If you were to have a look at these explorers, they all have a different number of mid and low slots. They have different align times, cargo holds, things like that as well that may influence your decision. I'm not going to get into the specifics of which one I think is best or worst. They all have their own advantages and disadvantages based on the situation you are in. For a brief moment of argument, however, if we were to look at the Tech 2 ships, for example, the Buzzard tends to be a little bit better for newer players, just on the simple fact that it's got more mid-slots that you can put scan arrays in, which will make up for lower quality scanning skills. On the other hand, if we were to look at, say, the Anathema, then if we go into this one and have a look at its simulation here, you'll see it's got more low slots, which means you can get faster align times out of it. You can even increase the cargo hold if that's what you really want. There's lots of different aspects that are going to influence your decision as to which of these vessels may be best for you. The point of this video is it doesn't really matter. I'm going to show you how to make the best out of the ship that you want to fly. 
Now, normally I don't put a discussion about skills into a video like this. I know some people have asked, can I showcase the skills every time I do a ship fit? But for me, it's the concept more important than the actual numbers. You can figure out how to achieve those numbers with the skills later. It's just, I want to showcase a fit that works and you can kind of work towards that. But because this is kind of aimed at starting exploration and getting a ship to run to a decent level, it's worth taking a brief moment to consider the actual skills involved in that, showcase what level the skills are at for me so that you can understand where those numbers are coming from and how to move yourself towards that same situation. Now, first things first then, let's look at the skills that I actually have, then we'll talk about why you would skill these, the kind of order that you should skill them in and where to go from there. Now, obviously, if you're into exploration, then the scanning skills are going to be vital. And you can see that scanning is the one category other than subsystems that I have completely maxed out. This is vital for someone who is going to be scanning, exploring, hacking, that kind of gameplay. Now, astrometrics is absolutely your king skill here. You need to get this one trained up and I'd get this to four very, very quickly. This is going to increase your, your scan strength. It's going to reduce your scan deviation and it's going to reduce the scan time the higher you have that trained. To explain those stats briefly, scan strength is what is going to help you find sites. Different sites require different strengths to actually pinpoint, and the higher your strength, the easier it is to pinpoint those smaller scan, uh, those smaller anomalies on your uh, probe window. So the scan strength is vital. That is what is going to actually allow you to scan down different sites. Scan deviation, essentially without going too far into it, when you launch your probes and you've got those eight probes in space with their little spheres around them and you press the button to actually scan, what happens is each of those scan probes send out a ping. And when that comes back to the probe, it reads that. And what you see in your probe scanner interface where the actual sort of cross ends up moving to is kind of based on which of the probes ping back that yes, I found something. And scan deviation is how accurate that is. Essentially, the higher your scan deviation, the less accurate your probes are. So you can scan something down, and if you've got high scan deviation, it might not actually really be all that close to the point in space that your scanners are saying, hey, it could be here. Having a lower scan deviation means that you're more accurate in your scans, and therefore you can kind of pinpoint in a little bit faster. Probe scan time should be pretty obvious. When you press the scan button, your probes cycle, and therefore the faster your probe scan time is, then the less time you actually have to wait before those come back. It just means you, you can actually pinpoint things that little bit faster as well. These are actually tied into individual skills as well. We have astrometric range finding. This is also a very important one. Each level is a 5% increase to scan probe strength. Get this trained up as a secondary priority after astrometrics. I cannot sort of overemphasize how important scan probe strength is. The other two are nice to have, but they're not quite as important. Next one on the importance is probably pinpointing. This reduces that scan deviation, therefore making it easier to scan a site because the little scanning icon, the little X or whatever, doesn't move around as much. So you can kind of scan onto something, then just reduce the size of your scan probes and just kind of keep going that little bit easier without having to drag everything around constantly. Finally, we have scan uh, astrometric acquisition. This is just, again, speed in the actual scan. And obviously the faster you scan something, the faster you can narrow it and pin point in quickly. This just means that you're going to find sites faster, narrow them down faster, and therefore be able to get into them faster. Beyond this, we also have archaeology and hacking. These both technically do the same thing, but from different sides. You've got hacking, which is going to increase the proficiency of your data analyzers, giving you more virus coherence, which is kind of the health, in inverted commas, in that, uh, that mini game. Archaeology does the same for relic analyzers. Now, I would kind of train these up simultaneously side by side. You're going to need those higher up in order to do the more difficult hacking mini games. Now, obviously, even though it's uh, it's referred to as the hacking minigame, it's also technically the archaeology minigame. If you are absolutely adamant you only want to go after relic sites, for example, then yeah, you can just train archaeology. But I do recommend getting both so that you can scan any site that you do happen to come upon. Now, just because you've got astrometrics trained up, hacking and archaeology trained up, doesn't mean you're necessarily done. The other vital skill I would go for is evasive maneuvering. This is such a powerful skill for an explorer. That 5% improved ship agility means that you warp and align faster. 
as an explorer, your only defense is not being there when someone is like actively trying to hunt you. So being able to run away faster, that's a good thing. Now, if we go across to skill plans at the top here, under certified plans, we can go into Explorer and then the Air Minmatar Explorer. If we have a look at this and show all of the skills that I have trained, this isn't a bad skill plan. I mean, there's a lot of interesting stuff in here. Some of it I really don't think is important. I personally wouldn't be training the drones skills because I don't see the point in ever really having drones in an explorer. There are niche examples of using ECM drones, but that's another topic for another video. If you are just wanting to get into exploration quickly and you like the idea of just getting into a site, sc you know, scanning down a site, getting into it quickly, and then running away if someone comes and finds you, then you don't need the drone skills. You also probably don't need things like the salvage skills that are in here either. You can be salvaging stuff that you scan down, but it's just really not that important. Um, cybernetics, again, probably don't need it straight away, something to come back to later. Um, that will just give you the ability to put in certain uh, like implants and things like that to help out with hacking and that later on. But again, not vital and kind of beyond the scope of this video. So not a bad like skill plan to start with, but I would probably curate this down a bit and get rid of the stuff that doesn't really do much for your ship. Certainly drones um, and things like well, surveys, not particularly important either. Drones, survey, um, and salvaging I would probably take off here and focus a little bit more on some of those other systems there around instead you know putting skill points in there you just go that little bit faster not a bad plan but do tweak it to what you need anyway that's enough about skills let's get into the actual meat of this video shall we and talk about fitting the ship Whew, right, okay, we can actually look at fitting the ship now, right? Well, if we go to simulate whichever vessel we've chosen, you're going to get this screen here. And if you're looking at a Tech 1 version of an Explorer, the Probe, the Magnate, the Imacus, or the Heron, then the slot layouts will be different for those, but the skills are identical. The bonuses you get from the hull are identical. Once you're coming up to the Tech 2 versions though, like the Cheetah, the Buzzard, the Anathema, and the Helios, it's not just the slot layouts that matter, it's also the bonuses they get. The Cheetah and the Helios, for example, get a bonus to movement speed whilst cloaked, whereas the Buzzard and the Anathema both get bonuses to scan deviation. Their scan deviation is reduced, which means technically they're better for scanning and exploration because you have an innately lower deviation, but by the time you've got the skills up, that really doesn't matter and it's not a huge difference so really don't feel like you have to pick one or the other. If you're looking at say the Metamorphosis, the Astero or the Pacifier, again they're going to have their own skill bonuses as well but again the numbers aren't going to matter, you know the actual numbers aren't going to matter, it's concepts. So I'm doing this with the Cheetah but you should be able to follow along with any of the other versions of these uh, explorers that you so desire. More mid slots, just as an understanding, means that you can kind of make up for lower scanning skills because you can put in the arrays, whereas having more low slots gives you the advantage of being able to fit more in the way of maneuverability and thus survivability in inverted commas. Again, we'll talk about that later, but it's just understanding the concept of what the different slots can be interpreted as. The high slots, however, are pretty much gonna be the same across the board. The first thing you're going to want, of course, when scanning is probes. Without probes, you can't scan. So we're going to open up the browser here on the side. We're going to make sure that high slots are either highlighted here, which we can do by clicking these, or we can just click high slots up here. We're then going to type in probe to give us this little list. We have a couple of different types of launches here and different levels of them. What is the difference between a core probe launcher, an expanded launcher, and a survey launcher? Well, core probe launchers are only capable of launching core scanner probes, the things you use to scan down signatures. Expanded probe launchers can launch core probes. They can also launch combat probes. We don't care about combat probes in here, so we're gonna ignore the expanded variants. Survey probes then launch survey probes, which again, we don't care about. So we can ignore expanded and survey and focus purely on the ones that are core probe launchers. Now, Core Probe Launcher 1s are nice and cheap. You can use them instantly from the start, but they are fairly basic. If we were to open these up and actually go into the variations and compare them, here you can see if we open these up, estimated costs, Core Probe Launcher 1 is the cheapest, Sisters is the most expensive with Core Probe Launcher 2 in the middle. 
There are some things like CPU usage as well. Core Pro Blanchard 2 is actually the highest CPU usage, whereas the Sisters is the lowest. Finally, the most important part really, I suppose, is scan strength bonus, and this is how this affects your scan strength. If you're using a Core Pro Blanchard 1, it's just your innate scan strength. Core Pro Blanchard 2, you get a 5% bonus. Sisters Core Pro Blanchard, you get a 10% bonus. Now, Obviously, the Sisters Core Probe Launcher here is the better choice. It's the smaller one. It also has the highest bonus. It's also a lot more expensive than the others. And so don't feel bad if you can only really afford Core Probe Launcher 1 at this point in time. Later on, you can start upgrading these. But we're going to kind of talk about how this affects things. So if I drop in a Core Probe Launcher right now, you'll see there's no stats if we mouse over this. So we're going to drop some charges in. Click on Charges, click on the icon, and then drop in Core Scanner Probe 1s. You'll see here we've got 94 points of base sensor strength. If we drop in the Sisters Core Scanner Probes, however, that goes up to 103 points. So you can see that the probes are going to matter um, even if the module doesn't. But again, if we go back and we just look at Core Scanner Probe 1s, 94 points with a Core Probe Launcher 1. If we go back across to modules and we put in a core probe launcher 2 and we put in those exact same core scanner probes instead of 94 we have 98 points if we come back again finally go into the sisters core probe launcher and charges standard core scanner probe ones we're now all the way up at 103 points that means if you want the best scanner strength you are going to want to be using sisters core probe launches. You're also probably going to want the sisters core scanner probes because those have a higher thing that puts us up to 113 points. Do be aware the hull and this one module with its eight charges is already nearly 60 million isk so bear that in mind based on the content you want to be able to complete. If you're in high sec and just starting out your career core probe launcher one with standard core scanner probe ones is probably going to be enough but you're going to want to upgrade eventually to something more like this. Now we've still got two high slots available, right? And well, this is a exploration vessel, so what else could we put in here? Well, the obvious thing to put in here, of course, is a covert ops cloak. That is, of course, assuming that we are in a tech two version of these frigates. You'll see if I go into the traits here, we have down here, can fit covert ops cloaking device. The standard probe, the tech one version of the cheetah, can't. The imacus, can't. The magnate, can't. The heron, can't. So there you would go for just something like a standard, uh, if we take off covert and type in cloak instead, we're just going to go for a standard prototype cloaking device and that will do the job nicely there. You just can't warp whilst using it. So obviously because I'm looking at being a scanny cloaky, you like flee away as soon as someone appears on D-Scan, covert ops cloaking device, definitely what I want here. Finally, looking at the stats here, we also know that this can also use the wonderful thing known as an interdiction nullifier. I've done an entire video of these. Um, again, these can only be used on the Tech 2 versions, but you can drop an interdiction nullifier into these as well and use that as a module to help you avoid bubbles. Only important if you're going into wormholes or into nullsec, because there you can run into interdiction spheres and that is therefore a very useful module. But you can ignore that if you're on a Tech 1 ship or if you're sticking to high sec and low sec where interdiction spheres aren't a thing anyway. So there's our high slots. Those are all done already. For our mid slots, we want to go hacking, right? This means we're going to need analyzers and we're going to need one of each. There are two types of analyzers, data analyzers and relic analyzers. Relic analyzers are used for uh, hacking into relic sites. Data analyzers are used for data sites. It's really that simple. And the difference between a data analyzer one and a data analyzer two or a relic analyzer one and a relic analyzer two is basically how good they are at hacking into those sites. The twos are obviously better, but they do come with the downside of requiring you to have archeology span or hacking at five. Therefore, you're going to need the Data Analyzer 1 or Relic Analyzer 1 when you're starting out, upgrading to the 2s once you have Archaeology or Hacking, whichever one's relevant, up to 5. Now, you can also use what's called an Integrated Analyzer. These essentially are going to allow you to hack into both data and Relic sites using one module. Again, if cost is not important to you, that is absolutely a way to do things. The Ligature Integrated Analyzer is basically the equivalent of a Data Analyzer 1 and a Relic Analyzer 1, whereas the Zoigma is basically a Data Analyzer 2 and a Relic Analyzer 2. But fun fact, let's have a look at the cost down here. Now, a Data Analyzer 1 barely even registers on the fitting there. It goes, yeah, it doesn't even register at all. Data Analyzer 2 takes us up a little bit. Relic Analyzer 1 takes us up a bit. Data uh, Relic Analyzer 2 
little bit more, about a million isk difference. The ligature pushes us all the way up to 246 million. The Zoigma pushes us up to 433 million. So I'm going to assume that a Zoigma is probably out of your uh, like a, a, your reach at this point. We're just going to go with a Data Analyzer 2 and a Relic Analyzer 2, and that's going to give us a nice starting point already. We can now scan down sites and we can hack them whether they are Relic or Data sites. No problems at all. But we still got two mid slots. You might even have three mid slots if you're flying a buzzard at this point. So what do we put in here? Well, we go back in and we have a look. In our mid slot menu here, we have a bit called scanning equipment. Under analyzers, cargo scanners, we then have scanning upgrades. There's a lot of different things we can do here. Cargo scanners are fairly popular amongst people. They allow you to basically scan the boxes that are in a site and decide whether or not it's worth hacking into. If that sounds a cool thing to you, you can drop one in. And again, whether you go for a Cargo Scanner 2 or a Cargo Scanner 1 is going to depend largely on your skills with the required amount. So if we go into Cargo Scanner 2, for example, requirements, CPU Manager 2, actually it's really cheap. We can just go for a Cargo Scanner 2 for the most part um, and work that nicely. A lot of people don't like it when explorers cherry pick sites though, because it means that the site takes a little bit longer to despawn. Quite frankly, your time playing the game is important, so yeah, if you want to scan down cans and decide that, oh, that one's only got one carbon in it, I can't be bothered, fit a cargo scanner. That said, I personally am quite happy just to hack into everything um, and get the site to despawn slightly faster. Therefore, we're going to look at your alternatives. If you want to put a cargo scanner in, go for it, but just be aware it's going to take up a mid slot that could otherwise be used elsewhere. Namely, scanning upgrades. Here we have acquisition arrays, pinpointing arrays, and range finding arrays. And what these do is improve your ability to scan. These essentially are like the scanning skills. We've already seen that there are three different uh, acquisition skills there, uh, scanning skills with range finding acquisition and pinpointing in the name, right? Yeah, the, the arrays do the same thing. If we have a look at these, a scan range finding array, what this does is it increases the scan strength when using scan probes. Very nice because it's going to help us scan down sites a little bit easier. A pinpointing array reduces our scan deviation, and an acquisition array reduces the scan time of scan probes. And the difference between the ones and the twos, again, comes to requirements. Astrometric acquisition five is required there for the acquisition array. The pinpointing array requires astrometric pinpointing five, and the range finding array, surprise, surprise, requires astrometric range finding five. So again, early on, you're probably only going to be able to use the ones. They're nice and easy to skill into. They don't need high skills at all to be able to fit them. They are going to help you scan sites down that little bit easier. I would always start with the range finding array because what that's going to do is increase your scan strength here. You'll see that's currently at 118. If I were to unfit that and go back again, it's only 113. So that scan range finding array is giving us five extra scan probe strength straight out off the bat. Obviously, if I could fit a two, boom. And that goes all the way up to 123 points. That's going to make it very easy to scan down even some of the more difficult sites in the game. Some of the most difficult sites in the game, for example. So I quite like going for one of these straight off the bat, just because it makes scanning a little bit easier. Now, the acquisition array is also kind of nice. What this does is reduce the scan time, the scan probes, and only one of these can be fitted at maximum. You'll see that it does have a 20% duration bonus for the Tech 2 version, whereas the Tech 1 version, it's only a 10% reduction. Again, it's all based on your skills. You can go for a pinpointing array here to reduce your scan deviation. Doesn't really show this up here, um, but if you're finding that the deviation is moving around a lot, then fit a pinpointing array. For me though, I quite like the acquisition array as the second one because faster scanning means I can get that site nailed down a little bit faster. And there's your mid slots done. If you're in a buzzard and you've got the third mid slot, well, why not go acquisition, pinpointing, and range finding? Have one of each. And if you really, really find that, for example, you need more than this 123, yeah, you could put in another range finding array there. And oh, it's now 130. It's gone up again. So you can use that as a way of getting higher scan strength to reach whatever it is you need to, array, uh, to reach. 120 is kind of a minimal point. 123, absolutely fine. I'm quite happy with that. So I'm going to go for the acquisition array for the faster scan time. This then brings us to our low slots. So looking at the low slots, I've got four of them here to work with. Again, when you are using a cheater, the most important thing that you need to understand is that I've got no defenses. If I'm caught, I'm dead. I'm not going to try and fit tank onto this because I'm not going to survive. Whatever catches me is going to kill me. 
all I'm going to do is prolong how long they have to uh, hold me before I go. And I'm only in a frigate. I'm sitting on 2,000 EHP. Like, it's not going to take them long. Even with some tank, it's, I'm probably not going to be able to hold out for friends to come and rescue me. If you're caught, you're dead. Let's just put it that way, right? So get rid of the notion of needing to fit any form of uh, tank onto the ship. You might decide you want propulsion in the mid slots, a micro warp drive or an afterburner. Um, since I tend to set up, I'm warping from point to point anyway, and I set up a perch so that I can warp out to the perch and then warp to zero on the next box, I don't tend to fit propulsion because I don't need it. I'm not actually ever really moving around. I kind of sit somewhere cloaked and I just warp to the next point and then I walk back and I'm cloaked and all that kind of thing. There's, there's no need to slowly move between the points anyway, so propulsion, not vital for me. And if I hit something like an interdiction sphere, I've got the interdiction nullifier. My survivability is purely based on running and avoidance, right? So in our low slots here, we are going to look into propulsion and most importantly, inertial stabilizers. Currently, my align time is 5.04 seconds. I want to get that lower so I can warp faster. And remember, your actual facing doesn't matter if you're not moving. Moving is suicide, by the way. If you are hacking into a container, stay still. Stay at zero meters per second, because then you are guaranteed to be going at your align time whenever you need to jump. If you've got a five second align time, it's five seconds before you jump. Simple as that. If you're orbiting, yeah, if you're orbiting and happen to be facing in the exact direction of where you're warping out to, you'll warp faster. But if you happen to be uh, facing away, you will warp considerably slower. So always park up and get ready to run out instead. This means what I want to do here is get this as low as possible. So we're going to start with some inertial stabilizers. Oh look, that's dropped us down below five seconds. Now because it's above four, this means we're going into the next server tick. Even though this says 4.04, it's actually a four, uh, five second align and warp time due to how server ticks work. If I put in another inertial stabilizer, I'm now down to 3.33. That's a four second align time. This is working nicely. 2.95, I'm now below three seconds. That means I'm going to be incredibly hard to lock onto as I try to warp away because it's normally about two seconds that it takes to lock on, meaning they need to click in the exact same server tick as I'm running away if they want to catch me. If I'm paying attention, that is very hard to catch. Can I get it lower? Let's put this in. Oh, 2.79, yeah, that is lower than the 2.9, right? No, it's functionally the same. If you're sitting at zero, 2.79 is a three second align time. 2.95 is a three second align time. Therefore, this one doesn't actually matter as much. I could try putting something else in here. Let's have a look, for example, an overdrive injector system. That could be something that we run with. If we have a look at these, what these do essentially is increases your engine power so you are faster moving. Is that important to us? No, it's not. And actually expensive cargo capacity, we definitely don't want one of those. We're not moving, we're warping from A to B. That is it. We could look then at something like a jump economizer. What does a jump economizer do? Let's read it. Decreases the isotope fuel requirements for Starship jump drives. Oh, not even remotely important to us. What about a warp accelerator? A warp accelerator, if we have a look at one of these, what this does, it increases warp speed and acceleration. No more than three can be fit to one ship. This could be kind of nice because it allows us to warp a little bit faster. It increases our warp speed. That's kind of cool, right? Is it? Is that really important? I'm not sure it is. What about a warp core stabilizer? Oh, this could be more interesting because what this bad boy does is when installed, it attempts to compensate for the fluctuations and disruptions in the ship's warp core, making you harder to scramble. Basically, if someone does get a lock on you and happens to use a warp scrambler, then yeah. They've got a warp, uh, warp scramble strength of two. You've got a warp scramble strength of minus two. That takes it back to zero. It's as if there's no scram on you. That's going to allow you to run away. Does that fit with our concept of running the hell away from every fight? Yes, it does. What about the requirements? Warp drive operation four. That's not too bad. We could train into that. Sure. But we've also got things like a standard warp core stabilizer one. Requirements for this are dead low. What does it do, though? Same thing. Warp scramble strength two. Awesome. It's just some of the penalties that are a little bit worse. That's fine for us. Scan resolution just means that it's gonna take a little bit longer to lock onto a box. Drone bandwidth penalty, oh no, we're not using drones anyway. Maximum targeting range bonus though, this does hurt a little bit, it drops us to minus 50, but again, we're warping from a perch directly to the box. We don't care about our lock distance. 
So we can just go for a warp core stabilizer one and boom, there we go. We now have that fitted as well. That's going to allow us to warp away if someone does happen to get that lock on us. So if we're in a bubble, we can run away. If we're caught in a scram, we can run away. And because we've got all of these, our align time is only three seconds. That means we're gonna warp really, really quickly. This now finally brings us to rigs. And rigs can do one of really two things when it comes to an exploration vessel. Three technically, but I don't really care about the third one. Let's go to that third one though to start with. This could be, if we open up rigs and astronautic rigs and small, we could go for something like auxiliary thrusters that give us faster movement, but we're warping between boxes, we don't care. Cargo hold optimization? Yeah, we could go from, 100, uh, from 200 cubic meters of cargo up to 230 cubic meters. I don't see that as huge either, but you might decide that's something you really want. Hyperspatial velocity optimizer. Oh, look at that. With faster warp speed, we've gone from 8 AU all the way up to 9.6 AU. Yeah, but at the expense of signature radius, which means we are faster. It's faster for people to lock onto us. And I don't want that because I want to avoid people as my main priority. Low friction nozzle joints. This is a line time. But again, it doesn't take us below two, so therefore it's still a three second align time. Whether I have that rig or not, I'm still going to be aligning in three seconds. And if I go all the way down to the Tech 2 versions, uh, say the low fr the friction nozzle joints there, still doesn't take me below two, therefore it's not important. That said, if you could use this rig to get you below the next whole number, absolutely go for it. If you're sitting here on say 3.1, uh, seconds align time and the rig is going to put you into 2.99 that's a faster warp speed that is worth doing but for me as you can see from the stats here as they're changing as i'm looking at things nothing is important under astronautic rigs so we can kind of ignore those can't we this does mean there are a couple of others we can look at scanning rigs let's go small scanning rigs we have emission scope sharpeners emission scope sharpener what does this do this increases the efficiency of a ship's relic modules. This also works alongside a memetic algorithm bank, which is incre increases the efficiency of a ship's data module. And it actually does this, if we go into the difference here, by basically your access difficulty, your virus coherence bonus here. It just means you are better at accessing those boxes. You're more likely to be able to complete a hack. If you're finding that your scan strength is already good enough, your scan speed is already good enough, then going for memetic or emission can really help you out with hacking through those sites. This does mean, yeah, you could go for two of the emission scope sharpeners and increase your ability to hack into archaeology sites that little bit better by having those there. You've now got a better virus cohesion on the analyzer there. You could also double up on memetic algorithm banks to go for data sites, or you could go for one of each of them to kind of just give yourself a bit of a better gateway into either of those. What about this one though, signal focusing kit? Does that help us? Let's have a look at the description. Ship modification designed to increase the scan speed of modules which require CPU management. Cargo scanner, ship scanner, survey scanner. So this is actually only of use if we're using a cargo scanner, a ship scanner, or a survey scanner. We're not. We don't have those in the mids, so we can ignore the small signal focusing kit. That leaves us one final rig to look at, which is the gravity capacitor upgrade. This increases a ship's scan probe strength, and if we look at the attributes, it's 10% per one of these. Now, what about the gravity capacitor upgrade 2? Oh, 15%. That's 5% better than the Tech 1 version, so let's put one of those in, shall we? Oh, but we've still got another rig. Can we get another gravity capacitor? Oh, no, we can't. Damn it, that's awful. What about if we put a gravity capacitor upgrade one and a gravity capacitor upgrade one? Oh look, there's our cohesion. And we've got 10 points from this one, 10 points from this one. That's bigger than the 20 points we would get from the gravity capacitor upgrade two. Basically, rigs are there to do, to just fine tune your fit. If you need more scan strength, we go for the gravity capacitor upgrades. And you'll see here we're now at 134 points. That's more than enough, right? 120 is actually enough for me. So I'm gonna take these out and go, you know what? I would rather go with uh, the memetic algorithm and an emission scope sharpener so that I have a little bit better survivability at actually doing the mini game in those hacking sites. It's gonna make it just that little bit easier for me to clear those. If you're just going for data sites, then just go for the me memetic algorithm bank. If you're just going for relic sites, go for just the emission scope sharpener. If you want a little bit of extra scan strength, go for the gravity capacitor upgrade. And that's it. 
there you go. You now know everything that I know about fitting a ship for scanning. I know there are going to be some people that disagree with certain concepts that I've put forward here. I know there are some people who are absolutely appalled that I tend to run a scanning vessel without a propulsion module. It's horrible, right? I've got a good reason for it. I'm only ever using perches, which means I don't ever really use sub-warp velocity anyway. I just warp from place to place to place and I do things that way. I don't ever need to just be moving or running. I've got other ways to survive that. I'm all about avoiding being caught. And I do that not through running away with a propulsion mod, but I do that with breaking a scram with warp core sca stabilizer, breaking bubbles with interdiction nullifiers, or just not being caught in the first place by using D-scan, a faster line time, and the ability to cloak and warp whilst cloaked. And that's it. This methodology works perfectly whether you are flying a probe, a cheetah, a pacifier, an Astero. The Astero is a little bit more complex because people insist on putting weapons in the high slots or taking big heavy drones with it. Don't 50-50 your Astero. If there's one piece of advice I can leave you at the end of this, of this video, don't 50-50 your Astero. Yeah, I know that there are people who always tell you, oh, I do it and it's just fine. Except, yeah, there's going to come a time where you decide not to jump out with your Astero because you think you can take them and you're baited and you're caught and you're destroyed. Or there's going to come a time where you try to hunt someone and because you've got some scanning and some damage, you just don't have the DPS to survive and win the fight effectively. And you're going to go into a scanning site unprepared for that as well. Have different ships. Have different ships. If you want to go hunting, go hunting with a hunting Astero. If you want to go scanning and hacking, go scanning and hacking with a scanning and hacking Astero. Same with the pacifier. It doesn't need weapons if you're going hacking. And so we'll talk about the Astero and the pacifier kind of more in other videos. But for now, that should give you all the advice you need for fitting an exploration vessel to your needs with the skills you have and the content you want to clear. And all of that, fit, modules, everything needed to achieve this, 70.5 million-esque. Not too bad. Not the cheapest out there, but I can make that back in an hour or so of scanning and exploration. So I think that's worth it. Anyway, folks, those are my thoughts and opinions. That's my methodology. As I said, I'm sure there are going to be some people out there who disagree. I would love to hear their thoughts in the comment section down below. I may disagree with you. You may disagree with me, but that's how I learn. The scientific method is to accept alternative proposals and see if you agree with those, if those stand up to evidence. And then I can adjust my rhetoric. I can adjust my understanding and come up with a new viable hypothesis. So, yeah. Chat with me in the comment section down below. Come join Catskull. And if you did enjoy this video, please hit like and consider donating. It really does help me keep making content. Anyway, folks, thank you for watching. Stay tuned to see all the awesome people who do pledge to support on Patreon. Otherwise, happy sailing and see you in New Eden.